Cash Flow Diary Podcast, Episode 313. Welcome to yet another exciting episode of the Cash Flow Diary Podcast. The podcast that teaches you insider tips, tactics, and strategies for creating leveraged streams of cash flow into your life. Learn from top performing entrepreneurs, business owners, investors, and thought leaders from across the globe as they share their secrets to success. Like what you learn on this and other Cash Flow Diary podcast episodes? Go to learninvestingnow.com and sign up to receive powerful tips and information that will help you succeed as an entrepreneur and investor. Now, here's your host, investor, entrepreneur, business owner, educator, speaker, author, and master facilitator of Robert Kiyosaki's cash flow game, Jay Massey. All right, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to another episode of the Cash Flow Diary Podcast. I'm your host, Jay Massey, and I'm glad that you are here today because we're going to talk about something that I'm going to say you're actually not even thinking about. Because I know the first time that I was introduced to this particular concept... <laughs> I wasn't thinking about it. I didn't even know there was something I could do about it. But today, some of you are going to find the thing, the very vehicle that you need to go out there to increase your cash flow, build a bigger, better, better business. And most importantly, you're going to figure out how to possibly make a whole lot more money at the same time. So what we're going to talk about today, I'm going to let our guest tell you that, but I'm going to tell you about him. Now, he comes to us uh, from very, very far away, but now he lives a lot closer, which is great. And he is a wealth strategist, educator, financial freedom fighter. He also is the chief wealth strategist of Valhalla Wealth Financial. And he, you may actually already be familiar with him because of the Cashflow Ninja podcast. Now, who am I talking about? I'm talking about none other than MC Lobster, and he's here to share with you because... There's something I I think this is interesting. You're going to learn how in the information age, we have the ability to do things that before would have been completely impossible because now he's going to talk about taking control of your own personal banking system, your own making it more efficient, an efficient cash flow management system for you for creating and building assets that provide streams of income. And I'm pretty excited to introduce you to MC Lobster. You there? Jay, I'm honored to be on your show. Thanks so much for having me. You are quite welcome. I'm glad that you are here. And, um, well, I've got a question for you. And before I ask that question, I'm just going to ask the question everyone else is already asking themselves. Because when they heard you speak, they go, hey, where's he from? So why don't you just tell us? Um, I'm originally from South Africa. So I grew up in a small holding outside of Stellenbosch, which is about 45 minutes from Cape Town all the way on the southern tip of Africa. Now, should we give away a special prize for anyone who can pinpoint Stellenbosch on a map without looking like they, like they knew before you said it? Do you think that's possible? <laughs> <laughs> that is possible. Yeah, no, it's uh, it's the winelands over there. So that's where people go to eat good food, drink good wine. Um, and uh, yeah, it's, it's just beautiful surroundings and mountains and views from there. Got it, got it, got it. Excellent. So I've got to ask you the first question that I, I ask everybody, and it's very simple. Are you ready? Sure. All right. So I, I tend to look at today's entrepreneurs a lot like yesterday's superheroes. So, you know, Batman, Robin, Wonder Woman, Black Widow, what have you, they're all superheroes of sorts. And I, I think entrepreneurs and superheroes have a ton of things in common. For example, occasionally we get dressed up. You know, we <laughs> think that, you know, hey, we're saving our customers and providing them a better product, a better service. You don't understand. And, and we got our cape and we're standing at the front of the room and we just know, right? Also, like superheroes, though, I, I believe entrepreneurs, you know, weren't always entrepreneurs in the same way that superheroes weren't always superheroes. Before Spider-Man was, you know, climbing walls, before Superman was, well, super, before any of these things were happening, they were usually ordinary people in some way, shape, or form. They have an origin story. So here's the question. Before you were the chief wealth strategist, before your own cash flow Ninja podcast, before all of these things my question to you is, who is MC Laubscher? That's a great question. Um, now, I definitely do not come from an entrepreneurial family. 
and no one in my family really were salespeople. And as a matter of fact, I would say that I was really bad at sales as well. I probably, <laughs> I probably couldn't sell an ice glass of cold water in the desert. Nice. But that said, I did, however, realize that I wasn't that natural at sales. And I also realized that it was a skill that can be learned. And if I, I knew if I wanted to go into business for myself, I needed to know how to sell. Hmm. And I think that's true whether you're doing face-to-face and interacting with, with people or you're online writing effective, effective copy. So inspired by some of the lessons I learned in Rich Dad, Poor Dad, I went into sales. I, um, as I've mentioned before, came from South Africa. I graduated university there and then, uh, well, grabbed a backpack, 500 bucks, suitcase, <laughs> a sense of humor and a sense of adventure. And uh, I hopped around and traveled a little bit. I ended up in the United States actually playing in a sports league over here, a, a national rugby league for hmm. a while. And while I was pursuing that, um, I found my feet in real estate. I uh, worked in real estate and in pretty much every single facet of it from um, – doing maintenance and turning over apartments to mm. lease negotiations to renting it out to property management bookkeeping advertising to eventually obtaining a real estate broker's license and then being part of a acquisitions team in real estate where we would go out and find multifamily unit buildings for for a, a private investor so i spent some time in the real estate industry i i spent some time in in sales. Um, and I will say that also not being that natural at sales, I was never that natural being an entrepreneur either, hmm. but I realized that if I can find guys out there that was already successful in doing what I wanted to do and study them obsessively, maybe I could pick up a couple of tips from them. So that's what I did. I, I studied as, as much as I can, learning from mentors, and I tried to emulate them. Um, I realized that a job is probably going to be the riskiest things moving in, mm. into the information age. And the security that you're going to have is by being an investor, an entrepreneur, creating value for others, and by creating value for others, creating income streams which will be the security in in the in the information age. Okay, okay. Now we've got a lot to talk about, and I love it. So, <laughs> uh, but but I gotta uh, you know kind of address the the really really big uh, elephant in the room. You know, you you said that you weren't natural at sales or being an entrepreneur, and I I hear this a lot, and I'm sure someone listening right now says, yeah. Me too. I right. I can't. I'm not a salesperson. Th- those are words that have come out of their mouth more than once, and it's truly what they believe. Right. My question is, how on earth do you go from that thought process to actually making sales happen on a consistent basis, so consistent now that you actually have a business? I think the first thing that you have to realize is, is that everybody is selling all the time, everywhere. <laughs> okay, now I'm going to play devil's advocate. No, uh I've never sold anything. <laughs> well, uh, you have a wife. <laughs> I, good point. <laughs> so you definitely sold there. You guys are happily married. There it is. Um, and the same with children. I mean, they're actually one of some of the best uh, best salespeople out there. So you're actually learning to sell from very, very little on, and that. That I think that's the first thing that we have to realize. And if you look at all the rela- relationships and wherever you are, it's either an idea that you're trying to sell, even if you're an employee at your job, you're trying to sell your boss on something. Maybe it's the promotion that you're working hard for or tr- for someone to try and work with you within your organization. You have to sell them as well. So It's not that daunting if you look at it that way, that we're always trying to share ideas um, and share our our ideas with with others, which is basically a form of selling as well. Well, well, okay. All right. All right. So I'll buy that for a dollar. But you also mentioned, and I think this is like paramount to the entire conversation, is 
I was always told that, you know, go get a safe, secure job. And you said a job is the riskiest thing. So what's up? <laughs> I think that what we've seen just in the last couple of years, and we can, and this changes every day too, um, with the information age, things are changing consistently, uh, continuously at ever increasing lightning speed. The disruptors are now going to be disrupted. You know, you, you thought you uh, could have had a job. Uh, let's just take, for, for example, dr- driving a cab. Now, all of a sudden, Uber <laughs> comes in. Well, that safe, secure job. You know, people need to go somewhere, especially let's use New York City. People are always going somewhere right. in New York, New York City. They need a ride. If they, if they don't want to take the subway, they're rushed. They need to get into a cab. Well, now all of a sudden, Uber comes in. So um, there's no – I think once you realize that the, the illusion of security that's around us can be taken away at any time by technologies and processes that we don't even know exist yet, I think we'll start to look at, a, at that at a – completely different uh different perspective and it tells it's it ties into the sales thing because i think that's such a very very good skill and it can be learned <laughs> um and it's all you know a big it's mindset it's i'm a huge mindset guy i know you are too jay you have to um expand that 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 mindset know that it's a skill that can be learned and hey then you have to get, go out there and uh, go through the school of hard knocks because is is it easy? <laughs> is it easy in the beginning when I think my my one of my sales first sales experiences too was just picking up the phone and calling people. Man, now that phone that phone was heavy. That phone oh, was heavy that first time. It's like very, ten thousand pounds. I know. <laughs> oh, I can't even hold this. This is heavier than a brick. Right. Um, no, it's uh, it, it's very daunting at first. I think that there's a lot of personal growth into it. You have to expand that mind, and I think it's a skill that you can learn. Jump in there. People are going to put the phone down on you. Of course they are. People are going to say no to you. Your your significant other or your children are going to say no to you. I mean, it's right. it's going to it's going to have happen in every area of our lives. Um, I think once you you learn the skills, you you know get a couple of go through the school of hard knocks. Um, you know, I think once you you reach that that moment of personal growth. You're going to have fun with it, too, because it is fun. Uh, you know, people are fun. Interacting with people's fun. So um, it's definitely something that can be learned. Indeed, indeed. And I'm glad it is because I was, uh, well, <laughs> not born with it either. Let's just put it that way. Not born with it either. So uh, there was something that you did say, though, that I think is interesting. Um, you said study them obsessively, them being other people, other entrepreneurs who have been there, done that. W- but you use the word obsessively. That's different than just read a book. Right. What, what do you mean? Um, I look at, so this is from a sports background. So what I did okay. in my sports days is I try to find the best players in my position. Hmm. And then I look at everything. And by <laughs> obsessively, I look at routes, uh, breakdown hours of film. I looked at what they did off the field, uh, their diets, mm. uh, you know, just the, 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 the whole picture. And I try to do the same thing with, with entrepreneurs as well, reading a book and saying, oh, that was great. You know, I learned one or two lessons. You know, I get in there with a highlighter <laughs> and make some notes about it because there's a lot of things that you pick up here and there, especially when it, be- it comes to the mindset of entrepreneurs. I think there's so much to be learned. Um, and uh, so I, I have a couple of entrepreneurs that I, that I follow and that I study, and um, I try, just try to learn as much as I, I can from them in all areas. So, um, you know, it's, it's every day I, tr- I try to look at, try to be a better person every single day than I was the day before in my business and relationships and just my personal development. So um, it's not a weekend thing where I just grab a magazine and say, oh, you know, look at Elon Musk. He's, he's, doing, <laughs> he's, up, he's up to some interesting things. I want to know what Elon's thinking, what his vision is, uh, how big he's thinking, what, you know, what inspired him to think that big. And then also 
uh, just what is his vision? What is some of his his goals? What are some of his benchmarks along those processes up until tactics? What strategies do, do does he implement in his companies that makes him so successful? For instance, how is he he how is he able to raise so much capital? <laughs> <laughs> it's that big vision again, and that mindset that feeds it. So I try to look at uh, I try to look at everything that that these guys are doing. Got it. Got it. Totally understood. So then answer me this question, please, Batman. How on earth do we go from rugby to real estate? <laughs> yeah, I think um, re- real estate, it's interesting. Uh, the book, I mean, obviously. Is it like I- rugby? I mean, I've never played. I mean, I'm just wondering at this moment. I'm like well, looking for the crossover here. I, I tell you, I tell you, there's no, there's no pads and helmets in, in real estate as well, just as in rugby. Got it. So um, I finished uh, Robert Kiyosaki's book, Rich Dad and Poor Dad, like many of your listeners, which expanded my thinking and my mindset and obviously uh real estate uh was to an extent a topic that came across in a couple of chapters in the book so i i looked looked at that i really enjoyed uh enjoyed looking at properties and real estate and analyzing it with the numbers and it, you can be very creative i think so that kind of fed that side of my mind and uh i purchased my first property actually in in south africa just when i graduated university and as a young man with full of energy and uh, a lot of ambition. I say, well, look at me. I read the book and studied and look at what, you know, now, now I bought a place. Well, little did I realize mm. school was about to begin <laughs> 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 and it hasn't stopped. <laughs> right. I learn every day. So not just in real estate, but in all the other areas in, in my business and my podcast as well. So, um, the real estate, the good thing about real estate was while I was traveling to, um, you know, I can, if I'm in, in an airport or in a different cities, I can still look at some properties in the morning in between team meetings, et cetera. So it was something that I was always interested in and, and looking at. Got it. Totally understood. Now, there was something that you said and you said it really fast, which was good because that tells me how quickly, it, how much of a non-issue it was for you. But I know there's a number of people who are stuck. You you specifically said that you enjoyed looking at the real estate. You you enjoy obviously the flexibility of doing so, analyzing and looking at the numbers and being creative. And there's a lot of people who enjoy that too. The challenge is they get stuck there. You managed to get a property really quickly. Where did that come from? I think that um that was part of the 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 athlete mindset of i you have to do you can <laughs> mm. you can look at a training program so long and then you have to get in the gym and actually go do it but but i'm afraid it, it, what if it goes wrong <laughs> and it, it's scary come on mc you got to help me yeah and i would say to that is once you take a step and you t- take a leap of faith whether it is in en- any investments whether it's a, as an entrepreneur in real estate um, will you be successful? Nobody knows. <laughs> you don't. You don't really know. But I can tell you that uh, the the process and the development that you'll experience as a, and the growth as a person um, is much more important um, than just that initially quick hit and and result. Even if I, there's some many successful. Uh, people that I am privileged to work with and have, have met as well. And, and we talk about this too, how they all, they all failed and they failed fast and the, right, some right away. And, and look at the, the first, the first property that, that I purchased, I, I'll be the first to admit, boy, did I learn a lot of uh, lessons. And I, did I, did I take a couple of, uh, of rugby tackles with that one? <laughs> But you, uh, you mean you just didn't buy it and the property just didn't make money <laughs> hand over a fist? You just didn't sit there and collect checks? That didn't know, happen for you? Mailbox money? What? <laughs> what? The the check just show up in the in the mailbox? Yeah. yeah. Oh man. Mm-mm-mm. No. Okay, got it. Got it. Totally understood. And but that's, you know, that's one of the most important things to understand is that the the lessons uh aren't really ever over now because you you finished university and i know a number of individuals who feel like well i did college i did university i'm done learning 
Um, how do you think that mindset helps someone become an entrepreneur? Oh boy. <laughs> well, um, you're going to, especially in this day and age, the, by the time you graduate university uh, and, and depending on the courses that you took, a lot of those, uh, knowledge that you gathered there is probably obsolete. <laughs> I don't even think they are teaching podcast courses in marketing classes at certain universities. Right. So um, especially in the information age, I think it was Alvin Toffler that said that the illiterate in the, in the future will not be people that, that cannot read, but it will be people that cannot uh, unlearn and relearn new skills. So we're going to constantly have to update our personal development and skill set because it's going to be become obsolete so much faster um, as yeah. as we go further and further. I mean, the technologies that are coming out it's it's just mind blowing every single day that I look at it. So we're definitely going to have to be lifelong learners um, in the information age and constantly look at. What skill sets do I need to acquire and um, get to provide more value for other people and be able to serve them? Because that's that's the security that, in my opinion, that you will have moving forward in the information age. But I, I thought you were supposed to, you know, become an entrepreneur and then suddenly, you know, you get to sip fruity drinks on the beach all day. <laughs> Take selfies on boats. Yeah, that's what's supposed to happen. That's it, right? Yeah, yeah. It doesn't quite work that way, and I think that there's a, there's definitely a, <laughs> there's a lot of misinformation uh, that set unrealistic expectations of it out here. Um, it, it, you're, it, it's not easy, <laughs> and it, it definitely isn't for everyone. Um, and um, I think that. It is a, like sales. It's a skill that you can learn, but you're going to have to put in the hard yards and then some more. And, uh, you know, everybody becomes an overnight success, Jay. Um, <laughs> yes, yes, exactly. I am only, always telling my team, we're four years from being an overnight success. Don't worry. <laughs> yeah, we're good. Exactly. We're good. Exactly. And that's, and that's funny that, that, that there's so many. So many successful people that come out and they say, well, you know, it, it took me about 22 years to become this overnight success. It's great. <laughs> so, <laughs> Just give or take, give or take, give or take. Yeah, yes, absolutely. Take. Absolutely. Now, interestingly enough, though, uh, I, you deal in an area where there's a ton of misinformation. But before we go there, I need to understand something because oftentimes as an entrepreneur goes on their journey – they, they discover, hey, here's a problem I can solve. Here's a gift that I can bring to, to the world. Very similar to how a superhero discovers that, hey, I got a super ability. And then they have to make a choice. Am I going to use that for good or am I going to use it for evil? And what I want to know is how on earth did you discover, you know, the, your, we'll call it superhero ability, but, and more importantly, why did you choose to do the things that you do today? I'm sure you're aware of this, but you're on a journey. And just in case you've forgotten, you've been on this journey for quite some time. And I don't know what stage you're at, but my goal today is to help you continue on that journey. And I know it's something that you can do. One of the things, one of the reasons I like asking that transformation question, if you will, is simply because... I want you to hear that other people also have to go through the journey and their first ideas weren't always the best. And this is also true for you. The first thing you try may not work at all, <laughs> but that's OK. It doesn't really matter. What does matter is that you keep trying. And that's something that you can. You physically have the ability to do. In fact, if you want to get a collection of some of my first ideas, some that worked, some that did not, you can get a copy of my book, Cashflow Diary, 10 Steps to Creating Wealth in Any Economy. Just go to cashflowdiary.com forward slash free book. Again, that's cashflowdiary.com forward slash free book. Pick it up, read it, then do it. Now, let's get back to the rest of the story. So I would say that how I discovered actually is uh, I belong to a couple of mastermind groups and fantastic just to learn from like-minded people. And I mm -hmm. discovered a strategy a couple of years ago 
and as part of a real estate investor, just to to look at my look at my personal situation in real estate and try and maximize every dollar that comes into uh, into my own economy and learn from it. I took took what I learned from that mastermind, I implemented in my own life, and I said, "Oh wow, this this is a game changer." And after implementing in my own life and just looking and just doing some self evaluating. I redefine my purpose and what I wanted to achieve. And it became a mission of mine to try and help as many other people implement this in their own life as I saw the value that it brought to, to into my life okay. and the, the, yeah, the certainty and the, and, and, and that it brought within my strategies, um, it, and I just I wanted to go out and and share that with as many people as I can. You said something that I think two things that are very very paramount for people to hear again, and I want to underscore because I know somebody was you know washing their dog or scratching their cat, and the kids yelled in the background, and they probably missed it. You you mentioned that it became a mission, and that what you do has given you a certain level of certainty. And I like those two concepts. Let's talk about those two a little bit. Describe for everyone, if you will, a little bit about what it is that you actually do and, and how it has how you discovered that this that 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 what you now do actually has provided you and your family extra certainty, if you will, and how that turned into the mission that you currently now uh, subscribe to. So what we do at Valala Wealth Financial is we help people and individuals and then small businesses, entrepreneurs, and professionals uh, build their wealth outside of Wall Street. So it's not in the financial markets. And then we teach them strategies after structuring a wealth plan and a solid foundation to leverage some of the capital that they've built out and create more assets and more income streams and the level of certainty that it brings into within one's financial plan is that there's a solid solid foundation that it's built upon and the certainty and predictability that it has it's it's initially built everybody's wealth strategy and wealth plan is initially built on very uh conservative strategies um, which provides certainty, provides predictability, and a peace of mind. You know, I look at a lot of a uh, lot of information that's out there of how to actually structure wealth plans, and folks start start right at the top at the pyramid, um, investing all of their money in qualified retirement plans, such as four hundred one ks, IRAs. Um, which is no no certainty, no predictability, et cetera, and that and and all the money that you can afford to lose, and it's not uh, efficient um, as far as safety and control, and then also tax fees, et cetera. That's where mo most of the people start. So, whoa, 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 whoa. hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. Go ahead. <laughs> I, I see again. You you keep saying small things that I don't think people are hearing. It, so I got to stop you for a second. Did you just say that a 401k wasn't safe? I have no control and I'm taking ultimate risk. I just want to make sure I heard that correctly. <laughs> Absolutely. And I think uh, b before I jump into that, I'll just say this too. Grow growing up in South Africa definitely uh, contributed to the person that, that I am today. I look at things very, very critically. <laughs> I evaluate it. I research it. And then I form my own opinion. Um, obviously, growing up in South Africa... Um, during the apartheid area uh, regime as well, I was about 13, 14 years old. Mm -hmm. So that was one of the, if I look back, one of the biggest influences on my life, because as from a young age, I really saw what was going on, um, which, uh, you know, where I am at right now in my life, um, that's how I think. And that's how I look at things. I look at things very, very critically. I do my own research and I form my own opinion. And when it came to building wealth, uh, I followed the same approach. Um, a lot of people invest in uh, uh, qualified retirement plans, as you said, where the, there's no, they do not have control over it. There's no way that they can influence any of, of, of uh, the performance of those products that, that's in there. There's no safety. 
So there's probably some some listeners listening to this that uh, that had brokers or financial advisors or planners that didn't put a stop loss on any of their their uh, uh, their portfolios during 2008 and 2009. That's because there's no risk management strategies involved in any of those plans. So the only markets go up, down, and sideways. They only work when they go up, and when they go sideways, the fees and the unfavorable tax treatment that these plans have kind of count against you. The other thing is, as far as from a tax planning stand, standpoint, um, they're not <laughs> efficient as folks see, can uh, think what they are. So Sorry, that I, I'm, I'm hearing you chuckle when you say they're not as efficient, which I'll rephrase as he's trying to say it nicely. They're horrible is what he's really wanting to say because they are guys. And I hopefully you're hearing what he's saying and understanding that there's something you can do about it. But more importantly, MC, uh, we got to take a step back for a second because sure. you might have used a word or two or phrase. I understand them, but I want to make sure everyone else understands things like a stop loss and more importantly, why a 401k doesn't have the ability to do that at all right so when uh there are certain investors that have money money managers managing their their money and obviously uh fund managers on wall street when they trade in the markets they can protect their downside with a stop loss which is basically an order that you put into the markets where uh for instance hypothetically so if if the stock if the stock is at ten dollars and you don't want to lose more than a dollar on that as part of as part of your position, well, you can put a stop loss at nine. So when the the stock actually goes down, uh, you are out of that position at nine dollars. Kind of like an insurance policy. Exactly. So there's they know how to uh, to manage their risk and have absolute downside protection. So within their models, they can structure their affairs, and it could get very, very intri intricate and complicated and to actually do this with options. So it gets even a little right. bit more complicated than that. But um, I'll just say that, that there is, are strategies to protect yourself from when there's a turn. People in qualified retirement plans do not have access to those technologies and that management uh, 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 strategies. And then, and then put, put another way, what he said is, this is how your 401k became a 201k. So um, <laughs> <laughs> That's correct. <laughs> with, with, with that being said, describe for us some of the strategies and things that you guys do that, can, that help us you know, gain more of this control. Or specifically, I know for me, one of the things that intrigued me the first time I heard about this was the idea of what we could do with things like uh, say our our excess reserves and, and and capital that was sitting on the side. So j describe for us some of the strategies that you guys have over there at Valhalla to to help us uh, manage some of this downside and possibly even turn it into a positive. Right. So what we do is we establish a a cash flow management system, and I'm going to use the word system here because. Okay. Professional investors focus on processes and systems and strategies. So they don't specifically just focus on products. So the product vehicle that is within the system that we teach is a specialized insurance policy structured with a chassis of dividend whole life insurance with a mutual insurance company. Now, I said let's fo th that wealthy and professional investors focus on processes and systems because usually when you say that, people get an, you get an eye roll <laughs> initially. <laughs> um, so let me explain why we use uh, just whole life insurance for this cash flow management system that we create. The first thing is the way that it's structured is there's a there's a concept and a philosophy called the infinite banking concept, which was popularized by Mr. Nelson Nash. Um, he wrote a book, Becoming Your Own Banker. And so the policy is structured with 
this philosophy um, as a backbone. So we use whole life insurance because the first thing is your money is liquid right away. And that is key for investors and even for in, in wealth planning to have access to your funds right away. If there's a family emergency, if you're a family, if there's a, a property that you like to purchase as a real estate investor, uh, liquidity is really, really key. The second thing is your principal is guaranteed. So all the money that you put in there, the principal is guaranteed. And there is a guaranteed interest rate that is paid on the money that you put in there. Then as a policyholder, in a mutual insurance company, you're also a shareholder of the company. And if these, if these companies pay dividends to their shareholders, so when they're profitable, which these companies are, most mutual insurance companies, they're a lot different than stock companies that's listed in the stock market. Uh, those companies are basically managed with short-term goals just to try and get the stock price up for their investors and stockholders. Mutual insurance companies have a very long-term management vision. They're managed very conservatively. They've been around since the mid-1800s. And when there's profitability in them, you get the opportunity to participate in the dividends. Now, the other part of this too is the growth inside these vehicles are tax-free. And then the distribution from them is tax free as well. Now, you're going to pay Uncle Sam. <laughs> we don't recommend not paying taxes. Everybody pays pays their taxes, but you can limit and reduce your tax exposure, which is one of the biggest wealth destroyers wealth destroyers out there. So, we'd like to pay taxes on the seed, not the harvest. So, inside of this, our tax growth is free and then when we distribute it and take money out that is free as well. This is a private contract between you and the insurance company as well. And as far as asset protection, which we live in a very litigious society and moving into the future, it will be ever increasingly litigious. Um, this offers asset protection in most states. So please check with your legal advisor on that or your asset uh, protection attorney. But in most states, it does. So from where, where dovetails, dovetails excuse me, really nicely with investments, especially real estate, is when you, take, when you access your funds in a policy structured according to the infinite banking concept, and with a mutual insurance company, you borrow the funds from the general account of the insurance company. So you don't borrow, <clears throat> excuse me, you don't borrow the funds from your own policy and plan like you would do with an IRA or a 401k. So outside of your plan, you're borrowing the funds from the mutual insurance company and you, you actually pay them a competitive market rate for that. And I'll explain why this is a good thing in a, in a second. You then can leverage that money and put it into real estate. Now that's fine. You've fine. You've taken the money. You've put it, invested it in real estate that produces cash flow for you if purchased correctly and managed correctly. But the 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 powerful thing is the money inside of your policy grows as if it was never accessed. So hypothetically, if there's a hundred thousand dollars in cash value that you've built up in this plan and you take out $100,000 to use as a down payment or purchase a property, that $100,000 in your policy grows as if that money was never accessed. So it still gets the guaranteed uh, interest rate. It still participates in dividends if the companies are profitable. And you've leveraged that money then to utilize in another area, whether to purchase a business, whether to invest in real estate, or whether to have as a uh, reserve account. So there's different ways of doing this. Obviously, you can you can use this for investments. You can use this as your financial foundation because you know exactly what's going to be in this plan five years from now, 10 years from now, 15 years from now. So it makes planning a lot easier. Um, I usually say if you don't know what you what you have 
uh, as far as, as your assets in five to 10 to 15 to 20 years, that's guaranteed. It's, it's not a plan. It's a guess. So that provides a nice, predictable uh, plan for families with a reserve account to access at any time. If they, there's emergencies, uh, you can use it. Actually, we do a lot of college planning in, in, in our firm. Um, for college planning, for instance, it, when you apply for financial aid, this does not count as an asset under the FA, FSA which they look at to award financial aid to students. So there's different strategies that we teach around that uh, of how to, to save for college. There's different strategies that we teach around how to utilize for real estate investing and then also how to acquire b- businesses uh, as well. So, you know, the, the rich dad philosophy, which I know you appreciate, <laughs> you know, you want, you want to, uh, you want to create income streams. You want to hold on to that money. And then you want to have that money work as hard as possibly for you and work it as many times as possible. So this way, your money works for you um, as far as a real estate strategy within these plans and then also uh, within real estate. So you have appreciation, equity, there's leverage, cash flow, and there's an inflation hedge on both sides of the ball, if you will, with this strategy. Okay. And for those of you whose head is still attached and hasn't exploded, what it (laughs) simply means is that you can have your cake, eat it too, and most importantly, enjoy it on the way and never freak out in an emergency all at the same time. So what I have to ask you, MC, is why does this, that what you just described, describe for me some of the, you you said you were first doing this for yourself uh, before it became a business. When you were going into it, what were some of the concerns that you had? But more importantly than that, what have been some of the benefits that you have found and that now your clients find, too, that you're like, oh, wow, this is great? Yeah. So when I initially came across this concept and how I've utilized this myself is the first question that I had is, wait a second, (laughs) what's going on here? (laughs) How is this? How is this possible? Because, you know, coming from the philosophy that I'd like to see win-win-win relationships all around the table for everybody that's involved in a transaction. So how does the insurance company benefit from that? Because I can obviously see that, wow, yeah, well, I do. So these guys, when it comes to risk management, insurance companies are the best that's out there. So they're the if you take a, a, a loan out from them, that policy loan is secured by the number one, by the cash value that's in there, and number two, by your death benefit. So that policy loan is, is collateralized with that. But insurance companies then also will be able to take the money, the premiums that you pay them, and they invest it in vehicles that are profitable to them. That's why Warren Buffett loves insurance companies, calls it one of the best businesses out there because of that. So they clearly win on that side and they're protected. And on the other end, I get to save my money in a very safe, well-capitalized institution that predictably guarantees me amounts across acro- along the way. And I can also leverage that money then to grow my wealth and to create more income streams. So I think one of the first things that, that I looked at is, wait a second, well, okay, so everybody benefits around there. Now, there are a component to this of insurance. So there's an insurance cost on there. And we, we use that in in the strategies because we look, we look at your wealth plan holistically. So we'd like to protect and secure assets as well in the event if something does happen to you or someone in your family. So that's, that, that, that's their component as well. So there is an insurance part of it. So when you initially put money into these plans right away, you're not going to have the exact amount of money available in your cash value that you put in there. You're going to have to build it up. But if you come from the mindset of feeding a tool and looking at this as a, as a, a business investment uh, that grows with, with time, okay, that I can then utilize and 
create more income streams for myself. You look at it as a process and as I mentioned before, a cash flow management system and not just an insurance product. Um, as far as implementing this in, in, in my own life, so I'll use, uh, I'll give you a couple examples. So okay. the one property that I have, um, what I do is the cash flow from that property goes into one of my policies and that policy I, I specifically designed to have a reserve account to build up for that property. So last year, of course, in real estate, you know, at some at some point, you know, when it rains, it pours. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, I thought those were just my properties. My bad. Uh, yeah, so washer dryers, a lot of other things that I had to fix. You know, it's been a great performing property for years, but one year, every everything started breaking down. Well, I could access uh, my reserve account right away and pay... Uh, pay for all of that and then pay back my policy loan through the cash flow and the extra cash flow that was in there because of the upgrades that I did. Um, my, my one, my company actually was funded with one of the plans that I put in when I said, wow, you know, I, I, uh, two other plans, uh, policies of this. And I looked at the performance. I structured one sp plan specifically to access the capital to build my my company, um, and the flexibility that comes with these policy loans, and again, it differs from institution to institution. So, the, the flexibility that comes with these plans is you can utilize the policy loan and the money, and then you set back the payback period. So, from starting a company po point, it was it was key for me because I could build my company with the capital. And then when my company started to become profitable again, I could pay back the policy loan that way. The same thing counts for real estate examples. Uh, if you use some of the money to purchase, tie down a, a real estate property, uh, let's use a single family house, for instance, that you, you, that you purchase or that you approve upon. Is if it takes you 30 to 45 days then to get a renter in there, uh, you don't have to pay that loan, obviously, back for 30 or 45 days. So when your renter's in there and you start generating cash flow, then you can start paying back those loans. Um, so I've personally used these these and implemented in my own life. And um, I try to to help as many, many people out there establish this in their own life. Um, real estate investing, obviously, a lot. I love working. Um, with with individuals, with families, with small business owners, with entrepreneurs, um, you know, we spoke about earlier about entrepreneurship, and I really, you know, entrepreneurs, I think, is uh, some of the solutions of a lot of the problems that that's out there. So we'll drive and make the world a better place. So um, I'm really passionate in helping them and in helping families establishing uh, security and and certainty in in their the financial lives. Totally understood. Makes a lot of sense. Now, for those that are listening and want to follow up, dig deeper, because you've skimmed over a lot of topics as it relates to how you go out there to create these cash flow management systems, etc., and their benefits. I know there's a number of people that want to dig deeper. What's going to be the best way for them to follow you, find out more, get more information, and, and figure this thing out? Jay, uh, they can uh, reach me at cashflowninja.com is my website. And then uh, for your listeners, if they, they can email me at info at cashflowninja.com and they can request a book. I'll make a, a free book available to everybody that's interested in this. I'll ship you a copy of Mr. Nelson Nash's book, Becoming Your Own Banker. If you're interested to learn a more about this strategy and how you can implement this in your own life, um, I touched upon cashflowninja.com, and you had mentioned earlier that I also have a podcast. Um, one of the reasons that I, that, that I created that podcast, that my mission was that, is to bring as many guests on there to share ideas of how to create those income streams because here I have this uh, this infrastructure to capture your wealth and leverage it and establish a cash management system for yourself and your business and then you go okay that's great MC but how do I <laughs> go out and learn and create these income streams you keep talking about right. well we have uh, we have guests on the show um, 
from real estate investors such as yourself that I've been privileged to have on there to folks that talk about how to cash flow gold and silver, uh, create income streams from coffee um, offshore, uh, and then online businesses, affiliate businesses, podcasts, uh, how to create online courses. So we have a little bit of everything on there. So again, that website is CashflowNinja.com. And if you want a copy of that free book, please email me at info at CashflowNinja.com. Excellent. And thank you for those free items. Now, uh, as, as we wind up here, I've got a final question for you because I, I want to hear how, how you answer this for sure. Because I see, here, here's what I know. I know that there's someone listening right now that needs to hear your specific answer in the way that you're going to answer this. Um, so for, for a moment, let's pretend that there's someone listening who... You know, maybe they're standing in front of the superhero outfit store right now, MC, and they're thinking, man, I want to be this entrepreneur. I want to begin to build this cash flow. I'd love to take advantage of that cash flow management system. I got to build my business. I can totally make this happen. However, as they're standing in front of the store, they're looking at it. They're thinking about the tights that they might want to pick out, the mask or the cape that they want to use. They also have in the back of their mind that voice. And it's a voice that you have done battle with. It's a voice that often comes up anytime we want to do something great that's bigger than our current and present self. And occasionally, for some of us, we're related to that voice. And it doesn't really go away. Always there, keeping us down, or possibly saying things that doesn't necessarily encourage us. My question to you, MC, is very simple. Let's pretend that in the next 72 hours, they're actually, the person listening is actually going to do exactly what you say without fail. What would you tell them to do? I would tell them to, well, that's a really good question. I would tell them to battle that voice by focusing at how you can provide value and serve others. I battle that voice every single morning when I get up. And through experience and through challenging my own belief system and thinking, I've found that energy flows where the focus is and I focus on how I can serve people and provide more value for others. And that's what I would focus on. I'll also tell them to start start small. You You can... As an entrepreneur, you don't have to uh, to put on the biggest, biggest cape out there first. You know, you can be Robin before you become Batman. <laughs> I like it. <laughs> yeah, you can, you can start wherever you are, um, learn a new skill, start something small on the side, grow it organically, invest in yourself, and then eventually you can trans- transform from a Batman or from a Robin into a Batman. Or bad girl, even. Or bad girl. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. I definitely thank you for for taking the time to to contribute here to helping us understand that sometimes you know we, we may not even understand how to utilize something that's just sitting right there in a bank account. Something very, very simple. How it can become a bigger, better, better asset for us if we would just take the time to educate ourselves a little bit more. And I definitely appreciate the contribution you have just made to the Cashflow Diary community and here. On the podcast today, sir. Thank you so much for having me on the show, Jay. I was really honored and I had a blast. All right, ladies and gentlemen, you know what time it is. It's time for you to move at the speed of instruction. What does that mean today? That means you probably need to be sending an email, right? Info at cashflowninja.com. Go over to Cashflow Ninja. Start listening to the podcast. Why? Because you're like, hey, here are more ideas, more people who have the ability to help you build your cash flow. That's not a bad thing. And he's going to help you make sure you get to keep more of your cash flow. That's a great thing. But none of it matters unless you do something about it today. You've got no excuse. You know exactly what to do. And I'm looking forward to hearing your results. Hopefully, they'll be great. It's been fun talking to you today. I look forward to talking to you soon. Until next time. <laughs>